Welcome to EuroPCR 2025. My name is Angela McInerney and I'm an interventional cardiologist from Galway in Ireland. And I have the pleasure to be joined today by Natalia Pania from McMaster in Canada and Matthias Gottberg from Lund in Sweden. You're both very welcome. So today we're here to, to speak about STEMI in patients with multivessel disease. And this is a really common presentation to our cath lab. So Matthias, how has the approach to these patients evolved over time? Yeah, thank you. Great being here. Well, back in the day, I, I'm thinking about 2010, 2012, we really didn't have any way of knowing how to address these patients. And like you said, they're quite common in the cath lab. 40 to 50% of our patients do present multivessel disease among the seven patients. So uh, there were two pivotal trials. First was the PROMI trial, and then it was the culprit trial. And both of them actually showed a reduction in events in the complete revas group compared to those who were deferred in terms of non complete lesions. And more interesting, although the studies were quite small, they also found that death and MI seemed to be trending or was significantly lower in those trials. So they were not really powered for that. And it was angio-guided PCI as well in those groups. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Did we actually have guidance to say that the complete revascularization using angio-guided guidance was something that we should do? And in 2015, there was another study by the Copenhagen group called Dynamic 3 per multi trial using FFR guidance and non-copper leashes. They also found a reduction in events, but it seemed to be more focused on the repeat revascularization or unplanned revascularization. So not really the same picture that we saw in the other trials. And, and so the, the data speaks for using, you know, complete revascularization uh, in the non compact lesions, but it doesn't really tell us what we should do. And then we had the complete trial, of course. Yeah, so Natalia, of course, the complete trial, you were one of the PIs on that trial, and it really was practice changing. It's the largest randomized control trial looking at complete versus culprit only PCI. What were the main findings of that study? Yeah, thank you for the question and, and great to be here. So when we work in the complete, we randomize over 4,000 patients to culprit only versus complete revascularization based on angiographic criteria. So a lesion equal or over 70%, it was randomized to complete revascularization had PCI. And this study showed clear, clear benefit in the complete revascularization arm. So for the primary outcome that was cardiovascular death or myocardial infarction show a reduction of events by 26%. And in the secondary outcome that was including ischemia-driven revascularization, we show a 49% reduction of events. So it was a clear message that the patients benefit from complete revascularization. And you also gave, had um, a lot of interesting findings in uh, from the complete trial as well, using intracoronary imaging in these non-culprit lesions, which gave us a lot of information about the morphology of these non-culprit lesions and potentially maybe how we should be treating them. Do you want to tell us a bit about that sub-study? Yes, we learned quite a bit when we did a multi-vessel uh, OCT imaging in those patients because over help of the non-culprit lesions have vulnerable plaques. So we got a lot of insights that the prevalence of vulnerability in these setting of patients is much higher. And that's really interesting in terms of how you might uh, manage those patients and how you treat these non-culprit lesions because there still seems to be a little bit of controversy as to how to approach the treatment for these non-culprit lesions, whether that should be angiography guided like in the complete study or whether physiology may be useful in this context. Um, how do you approach these on a pragmatic point of view in your cath lab, Matthias? Yeah, thanks. So, so this is really about a preemptive strike. This is about treating lesions that not necessarily cause ischemia or cause symptoms, because if we talk to the patients, the majority of them actually don't have any symptoms prior to the STEMI. Um, so from a pragmatic point of view, what we try to do is uh, if it's a focal lesion or if it's clearly significant using physiology, uh, or we, sometimes we use imaging as well. We leave that up to the operators of that sites to decide. But we typically use either of those modalities when it comes to revascularization to find what criteria that promotes revascularization versus deferral. We don't typically just use Andrew guidance. And the other thing is it's diffuse disease versus focal disease. We aim to try to know that we actually end up with a good result because we know the focal lesions are the ones that are more prone to rupture. 
So I think it's fair to say that here in 2025, while we know that we should aim for complete revascularization in these patients, how we get there can, is a little controversial as to whether it's angio-guided, physiology-guided. We have some more trials coming down the line and particularly the complete two, Natalia. Yeah, that's a, it's a great study and we are very happy working on it because once we transfer the message to our community that the patients need complete revascularization and angiography was an enough criteria to do complete, we also feel responsible to understand which of those lesions really are going to benefit from revascularization. So we have great tools as physiology, but by now we haven't been able really show like if there is a real benefit of this and we need a clear answer because we have had questionable results from some of the studies. So I think as a community, we need to know if physiology really has a place here. So in the complete two, we are randomizing over 5,000 patients to angio-guided PCI versus physiology-guided PCI. And I think this for sure is gonna answer the question whether physiology is a good tool in this setting, yes or not. And we also had a very large imaging sub-study that is 1,500 patients are gonna have multivessel OCT. So we are gonna have great um, great information about these non-culprit lesions. It's like a natural history mm. study again in these non-culprit lesions. And I think this for sure is gonna answer that question. So this is gonna be really interesting data when we get it and hopefully will answer this for us definitively so that we actually know how to approach these patients. But I guess one other thing um, in terms of approaching these patients is when you treat these non-culprit lesions. Should we be doing it during the index procedure? Should we be doing it during the index hospitalization? Or should we bring the patient back in six weeks time, for example, and then revascularize them? So the complete trial actually provided some data on that. It's actually said it was safe to do it either at index revascularization or up to 45 days. It showed there was actually no increase in events in delaying it. So it really comes down to a pragmatic decision making, whether it was a large STEMI, it's a simple non carpet lesion versus a complex non carpet lesion. So either you can sort of stage depending on those risk factors for the patients in itself. Yeah, so I think that's really important, isn't it, is that you have to individualize it to the patient. That's really a pragmatic um, kind of viewpoint on it and how to approach uh, these patients. So I think we've had a really good discussion. I think we've um, really kind of covered how complete revascularization benefits our patients and we know this for sure. How we get there, we still need that data and hopefully we're going to get it from the uh, complete two trial. Um, and of course, when we revascularize these patients is um, is also important and should be um, individualized. So I'd like to thank both of you for joining me here today and I hope that you enjoy the rest of PCR 2025. Thank you. Thank you.